Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha I incessantly prostrate with joy to Shri Ganesh to ward off obstacles, to Saraswati for obtaining a clear understanding of the word and its meaning, and to the Guru to understand the secrets. Namaste. So now we're continuing with the first chapter of uh, Tripura Rahasya. And this chapter sets the scene and the context for the whole rest of the book, including the Jnana Kanda, which we started earlier. But I decided not to go ahead with that until we went back here to the Mahatmya Kanda, which describes who is Tripura Sundari. Prostrations unto Tripura Sundari, the transcendental queen, who is seed unto the petals of the entire auspicious world, who is Shiva, the auspicious, who is Shakti, the power, who is Brahma, who is the witness of the immense universal dissolution, who is nectar unto the resuscitation of burnt up Kama, the Lord of Love. So this is the opening shloka. And this is a capsule description, a summary of the goddess. Who is she? Who is Tripura? Well, first of all, the name Tripura is very deep. Tri means three. And Pura means cities. But here it's talking about the three worlds, Bhur, Bhuva, and Sva, huh? the earthly realm, the celestial realm, and the realm of the gods. She is the queen huh? of all three worlds. Actually, she is all three worlds. The whole material creation is her body. So she has many forms, and one of them is this universal form of the three worlds. And she has many other forms, which are more and more subtle. But the first one that we become aware of is the world itself, isn't it? We are all in a relationship with the goddess, because we are in the world. These are the first words of Ramana's masterpiece. Uladu Narpadu. Because we see the world, we require an explanation for it. We have to explain to ourselves, we have to make sense of the situation in which we find ourselves. This huge cosmic manifestation is inexplicable unless we accept the existence of of a higher intelligence, a higher force, an energy which pervades everything and which controls the cosmic manifestation. I mean, it's easy to understand. If you have a complicated machine, a powerful complicated machine, like a big industrial plant or something like that, huh? there has to be a controller. There has to be an intelligent designer. And if it's something beautiful, you know, like manufacturing cars, let's say, <laughs> the cars have to be designed by an artist, not just by an engineer. Actually, both are necessary, both different kinds of intelligent design. So we see this beautiful cosmic manifestation that's operating so wonderfully isn't it? How does the sun shine steadily for billions of years? Huh? 
Actually, some stars don't shine steadily. Some of them fluctuate wildly, violently even. How is it that our star, our sun, is just nice and steady and smooth? And how is it that our moon is exactly the same apparent diameter as the sun? And when the moon moves in front, it eclipses the sun perfectly. Coincidence? Ha! <laughs> Such things don't happen by coincidence. That indicates the existence of a higher intelligence. So what is this higher intelligence? Well, <laughs> that's what this whole thing is about. So she is the transcendental queen. Sundari means beautiful. Huh? So she's beautiful. Tripura, Sundari, the beautiful three worlds. Huh? The worlds are beautiful. Even if sometimes they seem to be chaotic or even cruel. Actually, life is beautiful. Doesn't everybody cling to life? Doesn't everybody want to stay in the world? Don't we fear and resist death instinctively? Why? Because of the beauty of existence. Because as long as we're in this world, there's some hope of experiencing that beauty. And so this goddess Tripura, Tripura Sundari, is the beauty of the three worlds. That's what her name means. <laughs> So this is the person that we're talking about. This is the subject of this voluminous book. Uh, we could easily spend the rest of, our, of my life <laughs> talking about this book. I just might do that. Because it's a wonderful, wonderful book that gives immense pleasure and bliss even to liberated souls. This is why, see, uh, for example... Chandrasekharendra, the great guru, he's the latest in an, a line going back 64 generations to the original Shankaracharya. And he was liberated from a very young age. But what does he spend his time doing? Teaching this path, this exact path, the worship of the goddess. Because even for a liberated soul, this is very beautiful. Beauty is beauty, whether you're liberated or not. So everyone can enjoy this wonderful story, which is full of deep meaning. Wait till we get to the second chapter. My God. <laughs> There's a conversation with Narada that will blow your mind. In fact, it sounds like something right out of Ramana Maharshi's pastimes. But right now we have to establish the context. We have to create the background that gives the meaning. So we want to go on and explain the nature of Tripura. She is the seed unto the petals of the entire auspicious world. That's the relationship. She is the seed and this world that we see are the petals, not even the flower, huh? just the petals, the outside, the essence, the flower that can produce another seed is something else. But we're going to discuss all of this in detail. This is just to show the overview, the big picture, huh? that she is the seed of this cosmic manifestation which is not essential. It's only the petals. It's not the core of the flower, the stamen and pistil, or even the stem. What to speak of the roots? <laughs> only the petals. And that's the limitation of our senses and mind. They can only perceive the external part of the world. For knowledge of the internal part, we need the scriptures. We need the gurus. They can explain the secret as described in the invocation. Who is Shiva, the auspicious? 
What? She is short Shiva? How can that be? <laughs> Have you ever seen the picture of Aradhanishwara? Here it is. This is Shiva and Tripura combined to show that they are one. This form was manifest right here in Tiruvannamalai. And there's a temple dedicated to it. It's called Agni Lingam. <laughs> Agni Lingam. I love it. <laughs> Look up the words Agni and Lingam. <laughs> so if you don't know already, she and Shiva are one. One person, two bodies. How is that? Well, Ramana also explains that Shiva is Brahman. He is the substrate of existence, pure awareness, pure subjectivity. When he wants to create the cosmic manifestation, he expands. And what does he expand into? Tripura, the three worlds. So this goddess is part of his internal energy who is reflected in the pure awareness of Shivam. See, this is very hard to understand because they're different, but they're the same. <laughs> they're one, but they're two. <laughs> Our Western linear uh, binary logic is very imperfect for trying to understand these deep, deep truths about the existence, the reality. Uh, so we'll often find that our reasoning is insufficient to comprehend uh, the reality the way it is. So in that case, we simply have to accept it. Well, that's the way God made things. <laughs> that's just the way it is, you know and not uh, try to figure it out, or even worse, if we come to some different conclusion by our faulty reasoning, then we try to argue against it or resist it. Then we cause ourselves all kinds of trouble. So, who is Brahma? Now, this is an interesting point. The Sanskrit of this verse is written in such a way that this word could either be interpreted Brahman, the substrate, the Shiva, or Brahma, the creator. Uh, the Sanskrit is ambiguous, and I believe it's deliberate. In other words, she is either or both. So she is very exalted and very powerful. She's above even Vishnu. In fact, the ten incarnations of Vishnu described in the Bhagavad Purana are uh, described as her expansions of her toenails. <laughs> so uh, she's a really big, really powerful goddess who is the witness of the immense universal dissolution. In other words, when the universe is destroyed, she survives. She gets to witness it all. And then she uh, goes back into oneness with Shiva to await the next creation. So, you see, these things are not only true, they're also allegorical. So we can also apply these same things to our own consciousness. And we're going to be making many comments on this throughout the duration of this uh, series. And finally, who is nectar unto the resuscitation of burnt up Kama, the Lord of Love. Well, that's a whole big story and we're gonna go into it in detail later on in the book. But basically, nectar, the Sanskrit word for nectar is amrita, which means deathlessness. Mrita is death, ah, mrita, not death. So immortality or deathlessness, she is that deathlessness 
which is given to Kamadev. Kama means desire. So Kamadev is, or Cupid, is the lord of desire, and specifically sex desire. And this is something we're going to explore in more detail in the next episode. The difference between the patriarchal religious paths and the matriarchal religious paths and how the patriarchies like Catholicism and Orthodox Hinduism, the orthodoxy in general, tends to suppress sex desire. Whereas the matriarchies tend to have a much more accepting and open attitude, actually a more realistic attitude. So we'll get into that whole thing later. I'm almost out of time. So I don't want to open that subject now. It's a big subject. We'll get into it more next time and actually throughout the series because we'll see in so many areas where the, there are differences in the approach of the Devi cult uh, or lineage uh, as compared to the orthodoxy, for example, the Shiva cult. And there are often conflicts between the two. But the actual truth lies somewhere in the middle, of course. Uh, neither one nor the other. Somehow both. So that is how one overcomes duality. And this path is designed to bring us to that consciousness beyond duality in an easy and natural way. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.